You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production in association with City News. So, everyone was hoping that there would not be a war. But there's a war. In the capital, Kiev, blasts break the night sky. And sirens sound as Russia begins its invasion, launching airstrikes at targets across the country. The question now is how big, how devastating, how deadly this war will be. When Russian President Vladimir Putin announced his forces were entering Ukraine, he also made a not exactly veiled threat to any countries who might think of coming to Ukraine's defense. Anyone who tries to be in vain, intervene, to be a threat to our country, to our people, should know that there is Russia's response will be fast and give you such consequences you will never face again and you faced again in your history. We're ready to use any development. Every decision can be made. So one country in Europe is aggressively invading another. The world is watching it happen and the threat of nuclear war is hanging over the whole thing. Great. We can't tell you, as you're listening, what is happening right now on the ground in Ukraine. But we can try to figure out what this means for the current international order, for millions and millions of innocent Ukrainians, for Canadians like yourself, and, you know, for the future of the world. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Balkan Devlin is a senior fellow at the McDonald laurier Institute and a super forecaster for Good Judgment Incorporated. Balkan, how hard is it to super forecast anything right now? Not easy. We were having a lot of debates up until the invasion, and there was a lot of <laughs> uh, disagreements. So it, 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 these things are very hard emotionally as well as intellectually, unfortunately. I'm going to ask the question that probably everybody listening to this has asked themselves or looked for the answer to. Is this the, uh, is this the start of World War III? Uh, hopefully not. But it is the start of a major war in Europe. Um, and this is unfortunately still at the very early stages of what might turn into be a, a much bigger and much more bloodier uh, war. N- knowing what we know right now, the attacks um, and the scale of it, this is only a very small portion of the Russian forces that are gathered around uh, Ukraine that are being engaging uh, Ukrainian forces right now. Um, so this unfortunately could get much, much uglier and bloodier. But I don't, you know, I hope that this is not the start of the World War III, but uh, it's the start of a major war in Europe. We will during this conversation, and I'll just say for our listeners, we're recording this on Thursday afternoon. Um, so we will try to stay away from, you know, exactly what's happening at the moment because obviously it's an incredibly fluid situation. And we'll we'll be spending most of our time looking forward to uh, the days, weeks, and months ahead and, and how things will change. But first, um, maybe I could get you to look backwards just a little bit. How historically significant is the invasion that we're witnessing right now? I think it's quite significant. If um, if you take, say, 2008, the Russian-Georgian War, for example, or, or the 2014, the first invasion of Ukraine by Russia and the illegal annexation of Crimea, if you take those dates as the, the, the end of the post-Cold War era uh, and the return, return of um, uh, great power politics and competition, this is the second step. This is uh, this basically wipes out any suspicion or doubt in everybody's mind uh, that great power wars are still possible. War is still a, a tool that will be and it will be and can be used by by great powers. So in that sense, it is or it should be seen as a wake up call. That force is no longer an acceptable uh, form of a foreign policy tool, and no one will engage in it because it is too costly. That should be a rude awakening uh, for everyone. So it is historically, I think, quite important. It is quite important also uh, the fact that this <clears throat> has the potential to turn into the biggest conflict in Europe since 1945. Um, so it is mm-hmm. very, um, I would say, very, very um, 
important and, and consequential what we are witnessing today. When you talk about a wake-up call, I have to ask, why was a wake-up call so necessary? How did the West seemingly, and I'm, I'm not trying to refer to everybody uh, there as a monolith, but but how did we get Putin's intentions so wrong? I mean, I read a lot from you know pundits and commentators, but also heard from politicians about how Putin was bluffing and posturing and may make a small incursion to make his point and et cetera, et cetera. And then we got this. I would say there are two basic explanations to it. Um, the first one is what you know the cognitive psychologists call mirroring. Um, we do engage in uh, assumptions that people's preference orderings, what, what people want, and how they make their uh, cost-benefit calculus is similar to ours. And therefore, if we think this is not you know, uh, a rational action uh, from the way we think uh, what we should be wanting for our countries and uh, for, for our people, uh, we would say, well, this is this is crazy. He wouldn't do that because it is it is irrational. That is what was called mirroring. You're basically trying to understand other as if it is it's like yourself. Mm-hmm. The second, um, I would say, and this is a, a, you know this is the, the vast majority of people um, who uh, who got you know caught uh, flat footed with this, and that is the motivated reasoning. That is, we don't want war, so we think war will not happen. Mm -hmm. Motivated reasoning is an extremely strong bias, cognitive bias. Uh, Because war is such a traumatic experience, because it's so stressful to think about it. And it is very much, it creates a lot of cognitive dissonance uh, in in people who see that the use of force should be relegated to the dustbin of history. It is extremely uh, cognitively demanding to think that others may or may not see the world in the same way and uh, may be willing to use force to get what they want. We, we, we try to convince ourselves uh, in a way that, oh, no, no, this is just bluffing. Oh, no, he's just trying to extract more concessions mm-hmm. because we don't want to believe in, in the fact that he might have a different calculus and the, and the resulting cost will be huge. And those are the two big, uh, big reasons. And of course, there's you know a multiplicity of others who, uh, you know, who rather, for domestic political reasons, uh, would, would rather you know under you know underplay uh, what is going on with Russia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that that's I would say is a small uh, small number of people. Most people were making these mistakes. Uh, were not making it because they are malignant actors or they are on you know in the pay of Kremlin or whatnot. They are making these because they have these cognitive biases um, and they don't want to think through these stuff uh, in a more more rigorous way. That's a really insightful answer in terms of why, you know, people and the commentators and everybody else could get it wrong. Do you think other countries, the UK, France, Germany, uh, America, underestimated Putin and why? I think there is an element of underestimation, but there's also an element of within the bureaucracies, within the security bureaucracies, within the military, as well as within the political uh, political classes, there is a misalignment of incentives. Hmm. We don't want to take uh, painful decisions, costly decisions um, today that might prepare us and our allies uh, to confront such uh, revanchism that we are seeing uh, from from Russia because it has short term political consequences. We don't want to, in other words, we don't want to spend pennies. Uh, but we will end up spending hundreds of dollars. Right. This is the typical thing again, like you know, in your daily life, people don't want to uh, fork out five hundred, six hundred dollars for insurance. But when when things happen, the, the cost is much much higher, uh, and this is true for for our, um, our our societies and our bureaucratic and political structures as well. You know, investing more in defense, um, you know, uh, decreasing you know reliance on Russian energy, uh, trying to target Russian oligarchs. Their dirty money in our banking systems, in our real estate, will create short-term costs for us. Yes, but we are avoiding a much bigger cost down the road. Mm-hmm. But the political incentives for politicians is uh, to look for the next election. The bureaucratic incentives uh, are to go along with what the politicians are are, are doing. I mean, there is no uh, incentive for, uh, for 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 the uh, for the bureaucrats to go. Uh, to say to the politician, well, you know, this will not be popular with the with the public, but we should do it because in the, in, in you know five years down the road, uh, this would you know, pr- you know make us much more resilient. That's not going to fly. Same reason we weren't ready for the pandemic. Precisely, and again, like the pandemics we had here in Canada, in the United States, elsewhere, we had 
you know, uh, plans and scenarios yeah. all the way to ready. We know what we were supposed to do and we still fail to do so. So there's this huge mis, you know, mis, misalignment of incentives. We do not want to carry any burden or costs, anything that even remotely, uh, you know, inconveniences us or, or increase um, our, our discomfort. We do not want to pay for it. But of course, that's a very myopic way of looking at it. We're not paying pennies today. Uh, we didn't pay pennies several years back, and now we are paying hundreds of dollars. And unfortunately, Ukrainians are are paying with their lives. I want to get you, if you could, to look forward a bit. And again, not going to ask you to predict what happens in the fighting tomorrow, the next day, etc. But but now that a full scale invasion is happening. How will the world change over the next few weeks and months? Um, how does the international order shift around this? I think it will depend on, on a couple of factors. One, uh, what will be the, um, the extent of, uh, of, of Russian operation? To me, at least it, as it looks like right now, what they try to achieve is a short, intense uh, attack with an aim to change uh, the government uh, in Kiev and then impose the, in or their own terms. I don't think they are interested in, in a long-term occupation, mm. but, you know, engage in regime decapitation, in other words. Um, that's why, you know, they're, they're targeting Kiev, they're bringing in paratroopers and, and others. Right. Whether that would succeed or not would also shape uh, how, uh, how long this would war, war would last, what will be the consequences in Europe. Um, and of course, like, you know, uh, Helmut von Moltke, said no uh, no plan uh, survives the first contact with the enemy. So just because Putin wants this doesn't mean that it will end up like this. So there's huge, you know, very large amount of uncertainty here. Mm -hmm. And that will in, in turn will have an impact on how international um, system uh, will, uh, will, will evolve and react. I can see two basic you know, things happening down, down, down the weeks and, and, and months hence. Uh, first, I think uh, even now uh, that will be uh, you know, disagreements within, particularly within European countries, or how much uh, we should be punishing Russia hmm. for invasion. That would determine, uh, I think that you know, that would determine to to what extent the Western unity can be can be preserved, or will there be you know, will this be poisoning relations between European countries as well as 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 others? So that's that's number one. How much, whether can we maintain unity and impose real costs on, on Russia or not. The second is what we will see is a much more earnest attempt to uh, provide security, military uh, security for the Europeans by the Europeans. I think this this is going to be their, their wake-up call that they need to invest more in defense. Mm -hmm. I think this will be, and I hope this will be the case, that it will be a wake-up call for Canada to invest in our own capabilities to defend ourselves, our, our territory and, and sovereignty, but also help our allies. It's important to keep that in mind that Russia is our neighbor in the Arctic. The second would be, a, a, in, a, in, a, in a way, a, a revival, a renaissance uh, of, uh, Russia, uh, of, of European defense uh, capabilities uh, as a result of this war. It might be slow. There will be resistance uh, within, within these societies for that. But I think the, 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 the road is, is quite clear that Europeans will take their security much, uh, much more seriously going down the road. And I think Canadians, uh, we also uh, will do that once this, this shock uh, is, is over. Since you just mentioned Canadians, I will ask, and, and I know this will sound like a cynical or a callous question, but North America, the United States and Canada have increasingly become concerned mostly with what foreign events mean for them in their own homes, in their own cities. So what could this mean for the average Canadian, really, going forward? I mean, the obvious answer, I guess, is higher gas prices, but what else? I mean, that's, of course, one uh, element. But the other one is there. Are, there's a, the human component to it. Yes. There's a lot of people uh, in Canada that has uh, family uh, family connections. Uh, that's, that's another one. But the third one, in a sort of bigger picture, would be that the, the realization that the, this rule-based international order uh, that Canada is very much dependent on for its security and prosperity is under attack. That our ability to trade with others, our ability to uh, defend our values and interests heavily rely on a stable international system 
where states don't go around invading their countries, their, their neighbors. Mm-hmm. This is being dismantled. This is being destroyed. And uh, this has been going on for a while, but I think this will be the, sort of the last nail in, in the coffin. Um, and that will have repercussions. A, a world that is not stable, a world that is higher, uh, you know, uh, trade barriers, a world where Canada cannot uh, defend and protect its interests out there will have to do it here at home. Arctic um, is is the one that gen- really jumps uh, into mind. Right. Uh, it is going to uh, get a lot hotter uh, in the Arctic if we think that it will remain uh, as a low you know, conflict area uh, in the next decade, we might be kidding ourselves. So we need to defend ourselves and we need to invest in more, which means, as with everything else, this is a trade-off. Uh, the more we need to invest uh, in our own capabilities because the system is is unstable and uh, we cannot rely on the United States or others, the less we will have resources to, to devote to other things at home. So we will see uh, a significant impact of that uh, going forward. In the short term, I'm going to mention this because you didn't hear our intro. I'm sure that you have uh, seen Putin say it, threatening other countries that might intervene with catastrophic consequences like they've never seen before. Um, Obviously, I think Probably most people agree that that's a veiled uh, nuclear reference, or not even not yes. even super veiled, really. Um, no. In what scenario does this escalate to become a threat beyond Eastern Europe? Again, asking specifically for Canadians, like not a metaphorical threat to the world order in the future, but an actual physical scary threat, the type uh, people a little older than me might remember uh, feeling, you know, when they were in elementary school. Um, if this goes uh, and ends up involving NATO um, countries, then we might be crossing a particular threshold. Frankly, you know, even as in his uh, you know, obviously disturbed um, stage, I do not think Putin has an intention to um, attack a, a NATO uh, member country, be it the Baltics or Poland or Turkey or elsewhere. But there is a risk always uh, that when a war, a major war, is going uh, on. In, 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 in the, by the borders next doors uh, of, of several NATO members, there is a possibility of things things can go wrong. So if we have a NATO member state uh, getting involved in it uh, because you know, uh, you know, the Russians decided that you know, the, you know, the Baltics or Poland is providing support for, say, Ukrainian uh, resistance fighters in, you know, three months down the road. It is a big mess and, and there's a big resistance going on in Ukraine and a guerrilla warfare in Poland and the Baltics are providing uh, you know, uh, logistics and support and so on and so forth. And Russians decided to take out uh, those, uh, those bases uh, in Poland and, and the Baltics. There, we are very, very close to a third world war um, scenario. So things can escalate and, and, and spin out of control uh, relatively easily. But unless we do have uh, a NATO involvement or a NATO country involvement in, in one sense or another, in a military sense, in a combat sense, not you know, sort of sanctions or, or, or other kind of, kind of support, but a military sense, um, I don't think we will cross that, that, that down the road. If we do, we are in a completely different world. Well, as we're talking right now, um, it certainly doesn't look like any NATO member will provide more than very slight support and certainly no uh, full-scale military aid to Ukraine. What would it take to change that? Or is that a threshold that just nobody is prepared to cross? I think that's a threshold nobody is prepared to cross. And this is also this also includes the Russians. I mean, we generally think about it, despite the sort of the, the threats that Putin is, is making. Uh, it is all important to keep in mind that as much as we don't want nuclear war, so does the Russians, right? They don't want nuclear war. Nobody wants a nuclear war. And nobody wants the possibility of an escalation to a nuclear war. So I don't think they will be willing to cross that uh, threshold. But again, war is a messy thing. It's very uncertain. Mistakes happen and things do happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, we might see if, again, it depends on how, how things develop, if this turns into a big resistance and a guerrilla warfare and Russians trying to occupy uh, Ukraine, or at least try to occupy and, and prop up a puppet regime and, and whatnot. Um, we might see you know, advisors and special advisors and this and that. 
um, you know, Vietnam comes to mind and other places comes to mind, uh, sort of proxy warfare. Mm -hmm. But I doubt sort of an official uh, involvement within NATO, um, NATO militaries in the conflict itself. Unfortunately, Ukrainians are, uh, are fighting this and will fight this alone. And therefore, it's actually very important for us to be able to provide all we can, both economically, but also weapons transfers and, and other punishments that, that we can impose on Russia, uh, short of basically engaging militarily with them. Uh, it may, it's, it's extremely important that we do that because Ukrainians are fighting and will fight alone. We've talked so far about the geopolitical consequences of it and, you know, everything from a bird's eye view. But there are obviously uh, millions and millions of Ukrainian civilians right now uh, under threat, under attack, scared for their lives. What's going to happen to them over the next several weeks and months? Will we see a mass exodus? Are we hoping for a quick uh, regime change and their lives go back to normal? What are the possibilities there? I mean, again, it's very hard to 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 say of course. Uh, how how it will uh, it will evolve, uh, but there are you know a few generic scenarios of that that could happen. Uh, one is that Ukrainians uh, will put up a fierce resistance. Uh, all signs suggest that they will be, and they are already putting up a, a, an important resistance. Um, in, in in a pitch battle, yes, you know, Russian army might be. A much more superior, but if things get into guerrilla warfare and irregular warfare, um, you know there are ways in which we can, uh, you know, level that field. So one one possibility is this: that you know, Putin couldn't achieve his desired goal of a quick regime change and impose his own, uh, you know, terms on on a puppet regime in Kiev, and it it devolves into into a big big war. This might lead to uh, refugees. Uh, and you know can can range from hundreds of thousands to millions. This has the potential to go and have you know Syria look like a, a child's play, mm. uh, unfortunately. Um, so that's one of the most terrible uh, terrible possible uh, outcomes. Um, the another one is if they if if Putin manages to decapitate the uh, you know Ukraine, Ukrainian government and impose um, a, a puppet regime there, and then they would they might start hunting around potential um, resistance. Uh, figures. This will, I mean, targeting, uh, imprisoning, and killing uh, not only the sort of security elements, but also political uh, journalists, uh, you know, politicians, uh, you know, intellectuals, and others. And we know from uh, from history, uh, from Soviet Union and others, uh, that uh, this has been done. Mm-hmm. You know, Katyn uh, massacre of, uh, back in nineteen forty one in uh, in Poland that Stalin carried out. Which aimed at you know eliminating the intellectual classes and officer classes of the Polish uh, people uh, comes to mind. This is the thing with the Red Terror during Trotsky's uh, role in the in the Russian Civil War. Mm. So I'm afraid there will be um, a, a targeted assassinations and disappearances and jailing of of prominent figures that could serve as uh, the, the the core of a resistance movement in Ukraine if. They manage to uh, impose uh, this this kind of change. Uh, the, the longer this goes, the, the the bigger will be the human cost. The last thing I want to ask you about, and and I don't know if this is precisely within your area of expertise, but I am sure that you have a lot of experience with it. You know, we are living in uh, unprecedented times. The pandemic is still raging. Canadians have been dealing with their own uh, unrest at home over the past few weeks. Now there's a war the size of which we haven't seen in decades in Europe. How do you balance all these things as you look forward to what might come next? And and for the rest of us who who don't have to predict things for a living, um, who are glued to the news and and feeling helpless, is there anything you would do or that we can do other than, you know, sort of cross your fingers and hug your family members and hope for the best? Uh, I mean, it's, it's it's a very hard question, but I would say two things. Um, one, um, for everyone, uh, that we need to understand and face the fact that the world may not conform to our wishes, and not everyone uh, shares the same desires and, and preferences that we do. So we need to be more resilient, both uh, you know, psychologically, uh, but also 
economically and physically. So I think it is important. This the, the, the pandemic show this. The the, the the protests and others, and the, and in right now the war shows this. That institutions uh, that we cherish and take for granted are actually quite fragile things. International order is a fragile thing. Democracy at home here in Canada is a fragile thing. Those need maintenance. And only an engaged citizenry that recognize the privilege uh, of living in a democratic country uh, requires a responsibility of maintaining um, those institutions make that make our, our way of life possible. And we need to be vigilant in their defense here at home and in their defense abroad. And if we don't, and if we you know, slide into complacency, the results is what we see what we see today. So I think developing that mindset, making our politicians held accountable for the resilience and for the maintenance of our democratic institution, institutions here at home and abroad is, is one thing we can all uh, do and, and strive for. That's a great answer. I want to ask you one more really short one because it's something that's been kind of chipping away at the back of my mind through this whole conversation in past few weeks. When we look back at this time a hundred years from now, if we're so lucky, is this kind of the changing of eras of humanity? You know, we've had the pandemic and the rise of digital misinformation and on and on and on. And it just feels, you know, we we are continually talking about unprecedented times. Uh, I don't think we're ever going back. Does it feel that way to you? Uh, you know, I, 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 you know, I don't necessarily subscribe to the cyclical view of history, but certain things I go with, I think it was Matthew 7, 7, um, there is nothing new under the sun. Hmm. Tools do change, the way they act change, but the basic human nature, I think, uh, roughly remains the same as it is uh, you know, 100 years ago. Uh, we still have propaganda. We did have propaganda. We had subversion. We are having subversion. We had war, and we are having war. What really changed, I think, is the the, the rapidity uh, of uh, of of the news cycle, and therefore the action cycle, which makes it harder for us to comprehend. Uh, but we might be well advised to uh, remember that although the tools do change, human psychology largely remains uh, the same. So is is the human nature, and that's why looking at history, we should be driving, you know, learning the lessons uh, from history of uh, of not standing up uh, to aggression has has costs. Um, new tools only change certain things. It doesn't necessarily alter the human nature. Is it weird that I find that really comforting, Balkan? <laughs> no, because humans like um, familiarity. We really deplore uncertainty and unknown. And that's, I would say, that's why, you know, uh, going back to our initial uh, discussion, that's why a lot of people don't want to imagine a world where we have a major war in Europe. That's the motivated right. reasoning, because we hate the, the unknown um, and we will, you know, grasp any, any sense of certainty that we can, we, can, we can find. Thank you so much for this conversation. Really insightful. Appreciate it very much. It has been always a pleasure to join you here. Balkan Devlin of the McDonald Laurier Institute and Good Judgment Incorporated. That was The Big Story. For more, head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. Find us on Twitter at TheBigStoryFPN. Talk to us via email, TheBigStoryPodcast, that's all one word, at rci.rogers.com. You can find this podcast in any podcast player. If you could, please rate, review, and tell a friend. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. Have a great weekend. Stay safe. We'll talk Monday.